Thank you for joining with me to study God's Word today. We have been studying for the last two weeks on dealing with messy relationships. And we're looking at six traits over this six-week period that God calls us to exhibit in our relationships with others. And these are traits that can clean up and restore a messy relationship. Or if we practice them consistently in how we live our life, they can prevent a relationship from getting messy in the first place. So just to review quickly, the first week we looked at the word love. And we learned that we should let love permeate our relationships. So we learned and studied that love begins in God, that Jesus is the supreme example of love, and that love is the quality that Christ commands his followers to have and to show in how they relate to one another and in how they relate in, uh, to the lost. So as Christians, we are to remain in God's love, and there's no other way that our life can be faithful and fruitful unless we remain in God's love. And also, remaining in God's love requires us to be obedient to Him. So that was the first week as we talked about love and how that impacts the relationships we have with others. Last week, we studied the word encourage. We learned that encouragement strengthens relationships. We were created to live in relationship with others, and we hunger for the affirmation or the praise of others. And so we need a healthy supply of encouragement from others to grow as God intends for us to grow in our relationships. And fortunately, too many of us are deficient in the area of encouragement. Maybe we're deficient because we don't give it very well, and maybe we're also deficient because we don't receive very much encouragement from others. So our lives and our relationships can become weak very quickly if we don't have encouragement. We study that we can encourage others by accepting them for who they are. We can encourage others to grow in a particular talent or a, or a trait. And we can encourage service in others. God's Word calls all believers to be encouragers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says that we should encourage one another be of one mind, and live in peace. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says we should encourage one another and build each other up. And then in Hebrews 3.13, it tells us to encourage one another daily. I hope you were able to find someone or maybe multiple someones that you could encourage this week and lift them up to be an encouragement to them. So that takes us to today, our third week in this study of dealing with messy relationships, and we're going to discuss the word forgive. To begin, let me ask you to consider this question. When was the last time it cost you a lot to fix something? When was the last time that it cost you a lot to fix something? You know, sometimes we are better off paying a higher price for something. It seems like we always want to find the cheapest way that we can to fix something or to pay for something. So consider these scenarios. Have you ever bought a generic brand of peanut butter only to discover that you should have paid the higher price for a brand name to get something that actually tasted like peanut butter? Or have you ever bought a cheap appliance only to have to replace it a year later because the low price you paid for the cheap appliance was matched by its low quality? Or have you ever tried to save some money by staying in an inexpensive hotel room only to find out that management kept their prices low by not paying for bug extermination? You know, a lot of things come at a high price, but they are worth it. I'd put forgiveness in that high-priced category. But even though it can be costly, forgiveness is the stuff of healthy marriages, healthy families, families, and healthy churches. Relationships grow when we can let go of a hurt, when we can let go of a wound, someone that wounded us somehow, or a critical remark that someone made to us. Today, as we examine Jesus' story of the unforgiving servant, I, I ask that you allow the Word of God to run through you to remove any remnants of unforgiveness that might be in your heart. We're going to be reading out of the book of Matthew. If you want to be turning to Matthew chapter 18. As we get ready to look at Jesus's parable that he told to his disciples, I want you to think what comes to your mind when you think of the word forgiveness. 
Is there some image that comes to your mind when you think of the word forgiveness? And then I also want you to consider who has taught you the most about forgiveness? Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent. Maybe you were someone that broke things a lot and your parents forgave you because they knew that they were accidents. Or maybe when you were at your grandparents' house, you broke something that was very prized and valuable to them, but, but they loved you and they forgave you for it. Who taught you the most about forgiveness? Let me describe the setting for our scripture reading today. Again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to be picking up right after Jesus had just given instructions on how to deal with believers who sin against other believers. The question had come up, what do we do if a fellow believer continues to sin against me? How do we deal with that problem? And so in verses 15 through 20, Jesus had addressed that question. And he explained that reconciliation between those two people was the goal, but his instructions anticipated that there would be times when the sinner might not be willing to be reconciled. And the church would need to discipline that person. So Jesus laid out instructions on what to do in those cases. And so in light of those instructions, the disciple Peter had a question on exactly how many times he was required to forgive someone, to forgive a believer who had sinned against him. So what we want to learn today, our main idea from Scripture today as we study the word forgive, is that forgiveness restores and strengthens relationships. Let's read in Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to start in verses 21 and 22. So it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. So this is, Jesus is getting ready to tell a parable, and the verses that we read next will be Jesus getting into the parable. And it's a parable that Jesus told to address Peter's question about forgiveness. And so this parable is in response to uh, Peter's uh, legitimate, curious question. We know that Peter was a leader among the 12 apostles, and we often, often see him kind of being a spokesman for the group. And it's very possible that all the disciples were wondering the same question that Peter asked. But Peter, the, Peter is the one that is recorded asking the question. And what he's asking Jesus is, is there a quota? Does it reach a number where I no longer have to be forgiving toward someone? So let me ask you that question. How many times do you think we are called to let the same person who has wronged us, how many times are we called to let them off the hook? It's a legitimate question. You know, Peter, if we look back at, at what he said, Peter speculated at the answer to his own question. He filled in the blank with the number seven. Here's, here's uh, the significance of that. Seven was considered a number of complete, completeness. The rabbis who taught during this time challenged people to overlook an offense up to three times. So in Peter's mind, by offering the number seven, that was more than double of what the rabbis were teaching that people should do. So the rabbis were teaching three strikes and you're out. You can stop. You don't have to forgive someone anymore. So Peter thought, this is generous. Seven's the number of completeness. It's more than double the number of times that the rabbis are saying. So um, he felt like that was a good answer to his question. Well, let me ask you this. What can happen when we forgive someone? Let's consider that for a minute. What happens when we forgive or when we don't forgive someone? First of all, if we forgive someone, it helps restore the relationship. Um, we forgive them. They wronged us. They said something, whatever, and they have come to us seeking our forgiveness, seeking to restore the relationship. So there's a positive outcome by giving forgiveness towards someone who has genuinely come in and asked for it because they recognize that they have said or done something wrong. But we can also refuse to forgive and allow there to continue to be a problem in that relationship. And let me caution you here. Because a lot of people are, are unforgiving. They, they hold grudges. They're bitter. They're upset. And they hold on to that, whatever that wrong was, whatever the action was or whatever the, the word was that was said against them. Refusal to forgive someone 
when they are truly expressing remorse toward you for what they've done or what they have said, not only hurts your relationship with the other person, but it also hurts your own spiritual walk with God. An unforgiving spirit or holding a grudge or being bitter toward someone, all of those can be hindrances towards spiritual growth. So let's look at these verses a little bit more specifically. So in verse 21, Peter realizes that Jesus is calling believers to practice forgiveness. There's no question about that. Jesus is calling for believers to practice forgiveness. Um, so he says, Jesus, where's, where's your line? The rabbis, it's implied, he's saying, the rabbis teach three times. What, what do you say, Jesus? And so when he asked Jesus if he should forgive as many as seven times, he was trying to guess himself what was the higher standard that Jesus would require. Well, if we look at what Jesus says in the next verse, we think Peter was probably feeling pretty good about himself when he, when he gave his answer. Uh, he probably felt the way we might feel when we give someone uh, an extra big tip, even though it might have been an inexpensive dinner. And, and sometimes in those rare moments of big heartedness, um, we tend to pat ourselves on the back. And I'm sure Peter felt pretty good about the suggested answer that he gave once he had asked that question to Jesus. And so I'm sure Peter was stunned by Jesus' response. Jesus answered by telling him that believers must always practice forgiveness, no matter how many times others sin against them. This means the grace we offer others should have no limits. There is no number. We can't draw the line at any number of offenses and claim that forgiveness is no longer the way of dealing with it. There is no number that someone can reach. You know, few people are ever going to be offended 50, 60, or 70 times by the same person in a short period of time. But yet the number Jesus gave in his reply can be translated either we should forgive up to 77 times or 70 times 7. Either way, the, the number is an exaggerated, very large number. And so here he's creating an exaggeration. It's a ridiculous scenario to capture the attention of the disciples, and it still captures our attention today. Because Jesus is saying for, the, for a Christian, forgiveness must be unlimited. Jesus is telling us, just keep forgiving. Now, I would, I would say here, yes, we are to keep forgiving. But if the same person keeps wronging you over and over again, you have to evaluate your relationship with that person and whether it is someone that you need to continue being around. Now, sometimes maybe you don't have a choice. Maybe it's a coworker and they keep wronging you, and you don't have a choice but to be around them. But the, but the message from Jesus is the same. No matter what, a Christian is to keep on forgiving. Well, let's also look what Jesus is not saying here. He is not teaching Christians to remain in an abusive relationship. Christians are called to accept moments of mistreatment from, from the lost, in the process of sharing the gospel with them, but not to um, give ourselves to being dehumanized or endangered by another person's constant abusive behavior. We might receive a harsh word when we are trying to share about Jesus with someone, but that's a small price to pay for what Jesus has done for us, and we are to be forgiving toward that person. Jesus is also, what he's not saying is that when a believer ends a destructive relationship, forgiveness remains a critical issue. So Jesus is saying that it's still a critical issue. He is saying that. Staying in an abusive relationship is not wise, um, and it may not be safe. Even though there needs to be reconcilia reconciliation, it may not be wise or safe to stay in an abusive relationship. And so forgiving the offender in the privacy of your own heart may be the way that you have to allow your heart to, to make peace with the situation, to move forward with your life. So again, just to be clear, Jesus is not saying that we should stay in an abusive relationship and just keep on forgiving that person. Forgiveness is key, but we don't stay where it is unsafe or unwise to stay in that relationship. Well, what happens if the offending party does not change? Think about that for a minute. What happens if the offending party does not change? What happens if they continue to act or speak in the same hurtful way towards you? 
you know, if there's no genuine repentance on, on behalf of the offending party, then the process that Jesus talked about leading up to where we started to read in verses 15 through 18, maybe that needs to be acted upon. And so you need to go back and read those verses on your own and study what those verses are saying. And if you feel like that applies to your situation, I would encourage you to seek the guidance of um, another Christian to read through, to pray through, to think through your situation on what you need to do in that situation. Well, think about your, yourself for a minute. Do you tend to be quick or slow to forgive others? Are you quick to forgive, or does it take you a long time to get to the point where you're ready to forgive someone? Then also think about how dependent is your forgiveness on someone else's apology? Are you willing to forgive even if the apology doesn't come? Or do you require the apology before you'll even consider forgiving someone? And then think about when do you find it most difficult to forgive others? Probably for a lot of us, one of the most difficult times to forgive someone is immediately after the wrong has occurred because it's still fresh. The hurt is still fresh, whether it was an action or a word. So a lot of times that can be the most difficult time to forgive. So to summarize what we've studied here first, Jesus says, forgive and keep on forgiving. There's no certain, there's no number. There's no limit to how, how many times we forgive someone. In the next verses, we're going to see that we should also remember that God forgave us. Let's look at verses 23 through 27. So Jesus, after answering and telling Peter, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, then started telling a parable. So in verse 23, he says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Now, every preacher knows the power of storytelling. Logic and reason can appeal to an audience, but nothing captures a crowd quite like an imaginative tale. People lean in and listen to a well-told story, and Jesus was the master storyteller. And as he often did, he told his stories in the form of a parable. Now, forgiveness of others stems from the fact that God has forgiven the believer. And so in order to present this truth in a way that his disciples could understand, Jesus told it to them in the form of a parable about the need for forgiveness. So he often introduced his parables by saying that he was making a comparison between a familiar life experience of his hearers and the lesson that he wanted to teach them about God's kingdom. So Jesus' use of the term where he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus using the term the kingdom of heaven indicates that his parable relates to how believers are to behave. So here we have a parable about a man with a major debt crisis. He owed the king a crazy amount of money and he had no means of paying it off. So when the king called it in, when it was time to settle up, when the king called for him to pay off his debt, the man, it says, fell face down on the ground, fell to his knees, fell face on the ground, begging his master to give him additional time to pay it all back. Now, in this parable, the king represents God. The first words of this story remind us of the authority God has over all people. The king wanted to settle accounts with his servants. It also teaches us that a time is coming when each of us will give an account to God about how we lived our lives. Now, in verses 24 and 25, it says that this particular servant that he was selling the accounts with, who owed him a huge amount of money, it says he owed him 10,000 talents, or maybe your translation says he owed him 10,000 bags of gold. There are differing ideas about exactly how much money or what the value of a talent was as a unit of money. But it is generally agreed that 10,000 talents or 10,000 bags of gold were to represent a, a money figure 
so high that there was no hope that this guy could pay it back. There were, he had no hope of making enough money to pay the, the king back. So this incredible sum of money represents the debt each of us as sinners owes to God, a debt so large that we have no way by ourselves of paying that debt off. So in verse 26, it says that this man, the servant, realized just how serious his situation was. He realized that he was about to reap the consequences of being so deeply in debt to the king. And so he attempted to bargain with the king. He wanted to keep himself and his family from being sold into slavery. And so he, had, he made promises that he had no way of keeping. Please just give me more time and I will pay you back everything that I owe you. And he had no hope of being able to pay back such a large sum. No amount of patience, no amount of time on the part of the king would have given this servant enough time to pay this huge debt that he owed the king. So again, scripture says that he fell on his knees or he fell face down before his master, showing that he recognized the king's authority and he recognized his own helpless position before the king. This was not a conversation of equals. The, the master, the king, had all the power and the servant had nothing that he could bargain with. He is begging for more time. That's all he could do was just beg for more time. And he begged for patience from the king. Notice that he did not ask the king to forgive his debt, most likely because he couldn't even imagine that such a great gift would even be offered to him. Then we get to verse 27. Let's read that verse again. It says, The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So there are three important aspects of the king's response to the servant's desperate pleas for patience. First, he did. Jesus described the king's attitude toward the servant who was kneeling before him. It says he had compassion on this hopelessly indebted servant. The king allowed this servant's hopelessness to stir in his heart an understanding of his situation and to stir in his heart a merciful uh, action toward him. You know, this same word of the king having compassion on the servant, this same word is often used to describe Jesus and his attitude towards the needs of people. Jesus acted on his compassion by ministering to the person or to the people in need that he was around. So first, it says the master, the king, had compassion. Second, his response. It says that his compassionate attitude motivated him to act in mercy. It says that he released him or he canceled him from the sentence of slavery. That was the punishment for his debt, was to be sold, was to be sold into slavery. And then the third thing, it says the master also forgave the unpayable loan. The king forgave the unpayable loan. Another form of the Greek word translated forgave is often used in the New Testament to describe God's forgiveness of our sins. Paul used that word when he wrote of God canceling our infinite debt to him through our trust in Jesus. So we said the king represented God in this parable. So what does this tell us about God? First, God has looked on our hopeless condition, your hopeless condition, my hopeless condition as sinners, and has felt great compassion for us and toward us. Second, in his compassionate nature, God has acted in mercy toward us. And third, through his great love and through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because of his love, God has released us from the consequence of our sins. He has forgiven our unpayable debt for our sins. Like the servant in this parable, we owe a debt because of our sins. We owe a debt that we can't possibly pay back. So how would you describe grace to someone new to Christianity? How would you describe grace? Could you use this parable to explain it to someone? How are grace and mercy connected to forgiveness? Well, to answer that, let's define each of those terms and see how they're connected to forgiveness. First of all, grace 
is receiving what we don't deserve. When we receive God's grace, we don't deserve it because we are sinful. But he gives it to us anyway, even though we don't deserve it. Mercy is not receiving what we do deserve. So what we deserve as sinners is the wrath of God. We, des we deserve eternal punishment for being sinful toward a holy God. So mercy is not receiving what we do deserve. Now think about it. God gives us both. He gives us grace and he gives us mercy. We deserve eternal death because of our sins. And God in his mercy does not condemn us. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. But he graciously gives us what we don't deserve, which is eternal life with him through his son, Jesus. Well, So... The king forgave the servant, and the king represents God. So if the king was that willing to forgive, why is it so hard for us to forgive? What are obstacles that hinder us or prevent us from forgiving others? Here are just a few. Sometimes people don't forgive because they're not ready to. Maybe they're mentally not ready to forgive. Maybe they're emotionally not ready to forgive. We all have to come to the time when we are ready to forgive someone who has wronged us. And hopefully as we practice forgiveness, that time comes quicker and quicker each time that we need to forgive someone. A second, a second obstacle that keeps us from forgiving others is we want to shield ourselves from further harm. So if we don't forgive that person, then there's no restoring to the relationship, which means we're probably not having much to do with that person. And so in our mind, if I don't forgive them, they'll stay away from me and they won't hurt me anymore. A third reason that people uh, are, have a hindrance of forgiving is that they don't want to give up the moral advantage they have. Let me explain what that means. When you are the one that's hurt, in your mind, you are better than the person who hurt you. But if you forgive them, then that restores the moral equalness that you have with each other. So um, you can no longer say, you know, I forgave you because even to hold your forgiveness over someone's head is not truly to forgive. You must be equal. We must forgive and then we must move forward in our relationship. So sometimes people don't forgive because they have a moral advantage. And then a fourth reason, again, this is not a, a complete list, but a fourth reason or that uh, we can have a hindrance to forgiving others is it requires renouncing vengeance. Um, we can admire inspiring stories of forgiveness, forgiveness, but when we are hurt, our nature is often that we want to get back at the person at the person who offended us. When someone harms us, uh, it's a really strong internal desire to want to hurt them back, to say something ugly back, to do something that hurts them. So a lot of times we don't forgive in the hope that just our anger with them over what they've done will somehow wound them or make them uncomfortable. So to forgive someone recognizes that uh, vengeance is unnecessary. Uh, so those are just a few things that can prevent us from having a forgiving uh, attitude towards someone else. So Jesus has said we must forgive and keep on forgiving. There's no limit. We just learned that God forgave us. Just like the king forgave the servant's debt, God has forgiven our debt to him that we owe for our sin. And in the last verses, we're going to see that we must forgive because God forgave us. Let's look at verse, let's read verses 28 through 33, but we're really just going to focus on verses 28, 32, and 33. But let's read all of it. Verses 28 through 33. So the servant had just had, let's go back and look at verse 27. The king, the king took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. It says, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. 
When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master, the king, everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? So the king had set the man free from his huge debt. He was allowed to run free. He could do what he wanted to, but he ran in the wrong direction. He ran immediately after someone who owed him money. And so this man that owed the second servant who owed the first servant that we read about, it was a small debt. It was nothing compared to what our first servant owed his master or the king. Probably it was about three months wages. So it was significant but it was still small compared to what the first servant owed. And it says that he grabbed him and he started choking him, demanding that he pay him back. And notice that the second servant said just about the same thing that the, that the first servant had begged of his, of his master. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But this servant insisted on following the strict rules. There was no mercy from him. The man owed him money, and he it demanded that he pay him immediately or be thrown in, pre in prison. Now, he did this in broad daylight. He didn't try and hide his actions toward this, this uh, other servant. And so everyone saw how he acted and how he treated his fellow servant who owed him a small amount, small amount. So the other servants seeing this, it really bothered them. So they went to their master, to the king, and reported what they had witnessed. And so for a second time, the servant was summoned to appear before his master, before the king, and give an account for his actions. The king, the king then declared this servant to be wicked. In what way had this slave been proved wicked? He failed to make the connection between receiving mercy from his master and giving mercy to his fellow servant. The king reminded him, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Now, verse 33 summarizes the central truth about forgiveness that Jesus was trying to teach through this parable. The master had told his wicked servant that the gift of forgiveness that he had received should have changed his life. He should have remembered the king's great act of mercy toward him and allowed that life-changing moment to guide him in his relationships with others in similar situations. The servant could have honored his master's gift of mercy by following his master's example in dealing with every person who owed him a debt in his life. Having accepted his master's forgiveness, because he gladly did. He gladly accepted that his master canceled his debt. He should have been willing to extend that same type of forgiveness to others. Unfortunately, when faced with the same with a similar situation, he made a decision to refuse the debtor's plea for mercy. The same plea that he had made of his master. The king even said, Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? By saying that, the king was condemning him for not making that connection between receiving mercy and offering it. You know, Jesus, when asked to name the greatest commandment, brought together two Old Testament scriptures to form what we commonly call the great commandment. One passage calls us to love God with everything that we have. And the second passage calls us to love others as we love ourselves. So in, in so doing that, Jesus created a connection that cannot be separated between our relationship with God and our relationship with others. He paired them together. We love God with all that we have, and we love others the same way that we love ourselves. So we cannot claim to belong to God on the basis of His grace while relating to each other in terms of keeping a record of wrong. If we love God because He loved us, then we also love others in the same way. So true forgiveness leads to both gratitude and it leads to transformation. When, when we both, when you and I both hear the incredible news that God, through Christ, 
will forgive our sins through our faith in Jesus, then the power of God's grace should shatter all of the sinful, selfish rules that we, ought, we often try and use to, to regulate our relationships with one another. You know, this unforgiving servant ended up in prison. The place where he was imprisoned was a place of torture. And he was going to remain there until he did what he demanded his fellow servant do, until he paid back all that he owed. And since the debt that this first servant owed was of such magnitude that he could never pay it off, being placed in prison was a life sentence for him. Forgiveness is not always easy, but it is always right. Jesus calls us to forgive and keep on forgiving. Only a heartless, cruel person would make a friend pay a petty bill when he himself had been pardoned for something much, much more. So as children of a compassionate father, we need to find it in our hearts to forgive others. We need to be forgiven, and we need to become forgivers. This is more than a one-time transaction. It means that we strive to continually forgive and to clear the hurts that affect our relationships with others. Well, why should forgiving others be an act of worship? Is it an act of worship? Why should forgiving others be an act of worship? Let's think about what that means. First, consider that forgiveness is costly. After all, look what it cost Jesus. The extravagant form of forgiveness that Jesus calls for is only possible when performed as an act of worship. What that means is that forgiveness is not an emotional reaction to a person, but a grateful response to our loving Lord. Think about it. It doesn't mean that our emotions can't come into play when we're forgiving, but we don't just forgive based on our emotions because we feel like it at that moment or at that time. We forgive in a grateful response to our loving Lord who has forgiven us. We forgive for His sake as an offering to Him who has forgiven us. Now let's think about what Jesus has taught here to his disciples, because he's teaching us as well. How do we live this out? Well, first of all, we can evaluate our own life. We can consider all the current relationships that we have and spend time identifying uh, any areas of unforgiveness in your heart. Do you hold a grudge towards someone? Are you bitter towards someone? Do you need to make an attempt to restore that relationship by um, asking for forgiveness or by giving forgiveness towards someone. A second thing we can do is that we can take a small step. Make an effort to extend forgiveness in a relationship where you've been wronged or you've been slighted. Take the first step, even if you have done nothing wrong. Take a small step to restore that relationship. A third thing we can do is we can take a large step. We can identify a relationship in which we need to be forgiven where you have contributed to bad feelings or where you have been completely in the wrong in what you've done or what you've said. And so with humility, make an attempt to bridge that gap, to restore that relationship. Go and be sorry for what you did and ask forgiveness from that person. You know, a good complimentary verse to our focal passage is found in Colossians chapter 3 in verse 13. And the Apostle Paul was writing and he said, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. He understood what it meant to be forgiven. He had persecuted believers in Christ and God forgave him for that. So he recognized. Let me read it again. Colossians 3.13 Bear with or put up with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I want to close our time this morning uh, with a story. This is a story about a little boy who was visiting his grandparents on their farm. and He was given a slingshot to play with. Out, and out in the woods he practiced, but he never could hit what he was aiming at. And so he got discouraged and he headed back to the house because uh, it was time for dinner. And as he was walking back, he saw his grandmother's pet duck. And out of impulse, he let the slingshot fly one more time. And he hit the duck square in the head and killed it. This was his grandmother's pet duck. He was immediately shocked 
he was immediately sad. And in a panic, he hid the dead duck in the woodpile, only to see his sister had watched what had happened. Sally had seen it all, but she didn't say anything. So after eating that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? And then she leaned over and whispered to him, Remember the duck? So Johnny did the dishes. Later, his grandpa asked them if they wanted to go fishing. And the grandmother said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me uh, start fixing supper. But Sally smiled and said, Well, that's all right, because Johnny told me he wanted to help. And then she whispered again, Remember the duck? So Sally went fishing, and Johnny stayed behind and started helping to fix supper with his grandmother. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, he finally couldn't stand it any longer. Every time, Sally would whisper, Remember the duck? And so he finally went to his grandmother and confessed to her that he had killed her pet duck. She knelt down, gave him a hug, and said, Sweetheart, I know. You see, I was standing at the window, and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. But I was just wondering how long you would let Sally enslave you before you confessed. I don't know what's in your past. I don't know if there's a sin that keeps coming up in your life, that the enemy keeps throwing in your face. But whatever it is, I want you to know something. Jesus Christ has already seen that sin. Just like the grandmother was at the window and saw what happened. Jesus Christ has already seen your sin. He has seen the whole thing. But he loves you. And he is ready to forgive you. Just ask him to. How long will you stay enslaved to that sin? Before you go to Jesus and receive cleansing from him. From him. And forgiveness from him. Don't let anyone, don't let any sin hold you captive like Sally did her brother by saying, remember the duck. If you don't have a personal relationship with God, let today be the day. Claim God's forgiveness for all your sins, past, present, and future. Know and accept that God loves you unconditionally. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for your sins so that you can have eternal life with him. Confess today that you are a sinner and that you are in need of the only one who can provide forgiveness for your sins. Like the servant in our parable, we can never do anything to pay the debt we owe because of our sins. The only one who can provide forgiveness of our sins is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Please don't wait another moment. Claim Jesus as your Savior and your Lord today. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful so much for your grace and for your mercy. Your grace to forgive us even in the very difficult circumstances. Your grace to forgive us no matter what we have done wrong. And, and help us to forgive others even when it's hard to forgive them. We can't thank you enough for the forgiveness you have given us in Christ and help us to always remember that just as we have been forgiven by you, we are to forgive others as well. It's your name we pray all these things.